Today we're going to talk about hearing and balance. I am Dr. Eric Paulo de la Cruz. I am an assistant professor too at the WBSU College of Medicine and these are my hospital affiliations. So for my references, Guyton's Physiology by John E. Hall, Atlas of Human Anatomy by Frank H. Netter, and various internet resources, usually in the form of images and videos. And I really give credits to the owners. This video is for educational purposes only, so thank you very much to those images and videos. A lot of medical students will learn a lot from this. We will start with basic ear anatomy. So in this slide, we'll see the pina or the auricle and parts of it are the following. We have the helix, the outer fold, and it goes downward and make up the lobule. There's also an inner fold, we call it the anti-helix, and we have a part here, anterior to everything. This is what we call the tragus. Just behind the tragus is the opening to the external ear canal. And this external ear canal, sometimes we call it the external acoustic meatus, it will lead us to the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. So, from the eardrum outwards, it is what we call the external ear and inside the eardrum is the middle ear and the inner ear. So the middle ear is primarily composed of the auditory ossicles, namely the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. They are housed inside a cavity. We call it the middle ear cavity. There are no communication from the middle ear cavity to the external cavity because it is sealed by the eardrum. The only communication of the middle ear cavity is through the eustachian tube. It exits into the back of the nose or the nasopharynx. The stapes is intimately connected with the cochlea as a part of the sound apparatus. And the cochlea is already part of the inner ear. Also part of the inner ear are the semicircular canals, which is part of the vestibular system. So the vestibular system is concerned with the balance and the cochlea is concerned with the hearing. So this is the hearing and balance apparatus. So the vestibular system, including the semicircular canals, will give off a nerve, which we call the vestibular nerve, and the cochlea will also give another nerve, which we call the cochlear nerve. Together, it is called the vestibulocochlear nerve or the cranial nerve 8. So in this slide, we will see the eardrum as seen through the otoscope. Surrounding the eardrum is a fibrous tissue called the annulus. And the eardrum is composed of two parts. We have the pars flaccida, which is superior, and pars tensa, which is a little bit inferior to the pars plaxida. So the pars tensa makes up majority of the eardrum. It is, it is thin, translucent, and very tight compared to the pars flaxida which is triangular and it is very vascular and it is not as tight as the pars tensa. That's why it is flaccid compared to the pars tensa. So this is tense, this is flaccid. Very prominent in the examination of the eardrum is the malleus. Okay, you can see the malleus here, and we can see the different parts of the malleus, starting from the umbo in the center, then the manubrium, and the short process. Okay, so if we do a uh, otoscopy, here we, we are in the ear canal going into the eardrum so here we can see the eardrum and and these are the other parts of the eardrum take a note of the cone of light it is positioned depending on where you're looking at if it's in the right eardrum the cone of light is in the four o'clock position and in, if it's in the left eardrum it is positioned in the seven o'clock position so here we will do a little review of the physics of sound and its properties. 
this is very very helpful uh, in understanding some of the concepts in the auditory mechanism so what is sound sound is an energy wave of particle displacement both compression and refraction within an elastic medium so if you take a look at this image we have a sound source and the sound is actually an energy wave which travels through an elastic medium in this case this is the air and the sound source will produce an energy which will displace molecules in the air and it goes to our ears this displacement we can plot into a wave that's like this one the vertical axis is the amplitude or the intensity and the x-axis is the time so this is a clear picture of what happens above this is using a tuning fork so a tuning fork also sets out a sound wave with both compression and refraction this wave will trigger the sensation of hearing we can hear sound either by a pure tone which comprises of a single frequency sound or a complex sound which comprise of more than one frequency sound and medium so sound can travel differently in different mediums in air sound can travel 330 meters per second compared to water which is 1480 meters per second and in bone it's 4080 meters per second so you can see here that sound travels a lot faster in solid mediums than in air and this is the basis of the tin can telephone when you speak here sound will travel to the solid string that connects both tin cans what is frequency frequency is the number of cycles per second so this wave is a high frequency wave compared to this one which is a low frequency wave frequency is measured in hertz so 50 hertz 100 hertz when it becomes 1000 and above we abbreviate it to kilohertz in sound and hearing we perceive the frequency as pitch so in this image the lower the frequency is we can hear it as a bass and the higher frequency we can hear it as a treble or a high note so high frequency equals high pitch or treble just like this one as we see in some of our sound systems we have the treble we have the bass and a low frequency has a low pitch or sometimes you call it a bass so let's take this video as an example i got this from can academy so listen to the explanation of high frequency and low frequencies Higher notes have higher frequencies and lower notes have lower frequencies. Humans can hear frequencies as low as about 20 hertz and as high as about 20,000 hertz. But if a speaker were to oscillate air back and forth more than about 20,000 times per second, it would create sound waves, but we wouldn't be able to hear them. For instance, this speaker is still playing a note, but we can't hear it right now. Dogs could hear this note though. Dogs can hear frequencies up to at least 40,000 hertz. So to give you a better explanation of high pitch and low pitch, we'll take the piano. If we tap the keys on the leftmost, we will have a really low pitch sound. And a low pitch sound has a low frequency, a low number of cycles per second, compared when we tap the rightmost keys, which has a higher number of cycles per second therefore it is a higher pitch so this is my piano and as you can see it's got lots and lots of keys running right the way along from left to right and each one of these keys represents a different pitch note that i can play so it's got 88 keys so that means 88 different pitches or 88 sounds that i can play with this instrument and right at the bottom which I can play you a few in a kind of useful way that goes from low sounds right down at this end. Hopefully I can play you a few. This is right at the bottom, kind of very rumbly sounds, very unusual in music to ever have a sound lower in pitch than that. Actually, the string's only vibrating maybe 10 or 20 times a second.
and then we go right the way up through the 88 keys and we get to the top end and this is where all the high notes are kept up here play a few of those now So that's how we visualize the frequencies. What is amplitude? Amplitude is a strength or level of sound pressure. This is perceived as volume. So if you take a look at this image, we will have a wave. And the higher the displacement of the wave in the vertical axis, the louder it is. So this is known as the amplitude of the wave. And it is perceived by the volume. So you can have the same frequency, but different volumes. Volume is usually measured in decibels. And to give you an idea what the decibel levels are, so if you have a lower decibel or a lower volume, usually whisper is around 30 decibels, or a quiet room is around 40 decibels. If we have an alarm clock, it's around 80 decibels. We have loud music or a chainsaw, it's around 100 decibels. Jackhammer or firearms is around 120 to 130 decibels. So that's to give you an idea the volumes of different sounds. Now, also in this chart, we can see that at 80 decibel levels, it is already harmful to our ear as it can result to a permanent hearing loss and those with 120 decibels and above it can already be painful when hearing it here we will know the pure tones and the complex sound so a pure tone is actually a wave with only one frequency so in this image we have a wave with one frequency 100 hertz and in this is part we have also a pure tone with one frequency at 500 hertz we can see that this has a higher frequency than this one but both of them are pure tones in this image however we have several frequencies that uh, exist and we call it a complex tone so a complex tone is a waveform wherein there are many frequencies each with its own amplitude and phase. In reality, what we hear are complex tones. Rare can we hear pure tones. Pure tones are only produced in the laboratory or a hearing center. So the sound that you can hear in nature or from someone or from your music is usually a complex tone and the ear will just dissect them to its different pure tones this is an image on equalizer usually we find this in our laptops or our music players it only shows that the sound we can dissect it by its frequencies like at lower frequency and a higher frequency and we can actually boost the individual amplitudes or volumes or intensities of each frequency so it goes to show that what we hear are usually complex tones but they can be dissected individually by frequency so let's go now to tones and meaningful sound so the ear is basically a microphone it just hears sounds whatever the sound may be but when the brain hears the sound presented by the ear the brain gives meaning to the sound so our brain actually processes this sound and gives meaning to it this will show that the brain and the nerve pathways are involved in sound processing from the ear. Let's take for example a pianist. Okay, so let's take for example a pianist. So the first few strikes of the keys, we just hear tones. These are just meaningless. They are just tones. But when our brain will try to process these tones, and associate it with something, then it becomes music. Listen. Okay, so first tones, and it becomes something meaningful. Okay, so. So, 
So let's go back to pure tone. Pure tone is the most basic sound wave because it only has one frequency. And this is the basis for the hearing test. The hearing test uses pure tones, hence we call it a pure tone audiometry. Like this one, audiologist will introduce pure tones to the patient. The audiologist will introduce a sound in a specific frequency and the audiologist will also introduce a specific volume to the patient and lower it to the level that the patient can barely hear it. So this is a typical audiogram. This is represented by the frequencies, lower frequencies and the higher frequencies. And this is represented by uh, the level or the amplitude. If the patient can hear at volume 10 on the 125 hertz, so the audiologist will plot it here. It means that the patient can hear very well because at very low volume, he can still hear the sound. Contrast that when a patient hears the sound at a higher volume, which means he can only hear that tone when the volume is that high, meaning he has some kind of hearing loss because he needs a higher volume in order to hear the sound. So as we go on, the audiologist will actually plot several pure tones and their frequencies and the volume needed to hear and this comprises the pure tone testing. Audiometry is very simple and it is usually available in local hospitals or local hearing centers and this is how we test if the, the ear can actually hear pure tones. So how do we know if the patient has a hearing loss? The patient will have hearing loss if he can only hear pure tones at a volume of 25 and above. It only means that the patient will need a sufficient volume in order to hear that sound. To compare a mild hearing loss, let's say in the 30, and compared to the severe hearing loss at 80, the patient can still hear at volume 30 compared to a patient which hears the sound at volume 80. So we see in this graph, the lower the plot is, the worse the hearing loss is. And this is a chart of the WHO. Take note that our threshold is 25 decibels. That's the threshold for normal hearing. So this is an example of a plotted audiogram. We can see that the patient can hear better in the lower frequencies rather than the higher frequencies. Take note that he has the worst hearing thresholds at the high pitch 4000. He can only hear the 4000 hertz tone when the volume is up around 55 decibels. So this is the patterns we see. You can hear at lower tones and worse on higher tones. What does it mean? Sometimes we put it in the speech banana. So the speech banana is a diagram we're in. So the speech banana is a figure which describes where the sounds used in everyday human speech or environment occur in the audiogram. Take a look at this audiogram. Still, we have the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies and the volume. We have several letters in our alphabet and the, these are lower pitch letters, vowels or consonants. And this is the mid tones in the higher frequency letters. Now, if you have a high frequency hearing loss, you cannot able to hear the F, the S, and the TH in everyday speech, just like Mississippi. Okay, Mississippi has a lot of S. So if you have a higher frequency hearing loss, you will just hear me, me, because you cannot hear the S. So this diagram also shows us the everyday sound that the nature provides. So the dogs usually bark at lower frequencies, the piano in the mid-tones, the jet are the higher frequency. So if you have a loss of hearing in different frequencies, you, you will tend to miss out the sounds that exist in those frequencies. Now let's go now to the auditory mechanism. So here is a basic uh, mechanism of how we hear. So a sound wave enters our outer ear and the outer ear canal. 
and it will reach our eardrums so this is the outer ear once the sound wave hits the eardrum it's just like a drum it moves the tympanic membrane and moves the ossicles behind it so these are the auditory ossicles this is already in the middle ear and this is the middle ear cavity and this tape is will actually hit the uh, cochlea and it will produce some kind of movement in the fluids within this movement of fluids within will produce an auditory signal through the nerves the cochlear nerve and these signals will go up into the brain for further processing so this is the basic uh, hearing mechanism and we will use this figure more later so the auditory mechanism will involve the outer ear the middle ear the inner ear and the, and the central pathway for sound conduction to the brain let's talk about air and bone conduction so there are two ways that the sound reaches the inner ear so again here is the picture first we have the air conduction we're in the sound wave will travel through the pina tympanic membrane ossicles until it reaches the inner ear we also have the bone conduction we're in sound can actually travel to bone it can hit the bone travels to a solid medium until it reaches the inner ear so it bypasses the tympanic membrane the ossicles and it stimulates the cochlea directly the inner ear is the real hearing organ so even if you don't have an eardrum or an ossicle you can still hear because this is the real hearing organ you can still here through the bone the inner ear can still hear at 50 to 60 decibels without the pina tympanic membrane and ossicles just like in this example we have a perforated eardrum we don't have an eardrum but the patient can still hear and also those with congenital ear deformities they don't have a pina or a external ear canal they can still hear although it is still better to have a tympanic membrane and the ossicles and the external ear because sound is better heard rather than sound heard on a bone as we will see later so the outer ear auditory mechanism the auricle contributes to hearing when it funnels and directs sound waves to our eardrum and the auricle shape is very important in localization so when we hear a sound source coming from the front our ear will actually funnel it and directs it into the ear canal however when we hear the sound at the back the auricle being shaped like this one it will actually deflect the the most of the sound waves and our brain will know that the sound is coming in the front or at the back because of the shape of the auricle this is more noticeable when you are closing your eyes no you will know the if the sound source is in the front or at the back the ear canal transmit effective frequencies at 3000 to 4000 hertz for example if you try to buy uh, earphone so if you take a look at the inlay card of the earphone you will see that it has a frequency range of 20 to 20,000 Hertz however in reality we only use a fraction of that frequency range because the ear canal with which where we put our earphones has only 3,000 to 4,000 effective frequencies the middle ear mechanism the tympanic membrane will transmit the sound waves into the ossicles and into the stapes this transforms efficiently air energy to cochlear fluids and will transmit 
efficiently the frequencies from 500 to 3000 Hz. So take note that the most effective frequencies of the ear canal is 3000 to 4000 and the effective frequencies of tympanic membrane is from 500 to 3000. So around 3000 4000. The transformation of air energy to cochlear fluids without losing energy is what we call the impedance matching mechanism of the middle ear. So I told you earlier that patients without eardrum or without ossicles or even without the, the external auditory canal can still hear. However, there are advantages when we have an intact middle ear structures. Take a look at this image. So this is the eardrum, the ossicles. Take note that the eardrum has a large area, bigger area than that of the stapes foot plate. So a big area into a small area, big area to a small area. There is what we call the area effect of the tympanic membrane. So take a look at this image. If we apply a force into a bigger surface area, the other end which has a smaller surface area will actually have more force than the original force. And actually it is 17 times more force than before. Therefore, the mechanism of the tympanic membrane and the ossicles is actually an amplifier. That's why if a patient doesn't have an eardrum, he will tend to hear a lot less than those persons with an intact eardrum. The lever action of the ossicles, like this one, will actually generate more forceful sound. 1.3 times more force. So therefore, if a patient has an intact eardrum and ossicles, it doesn't lose energy on transmission, but it amplifies sound at around 25 to 30 decibels. Now let's talk about the auditory mechanism in the inner ear. Let's talk about the pathway of vibrations. So the cochlea is responsible to receive all vibrations from the outer and middle ear. So let's take a look at the cochlea. This is the cochlea is the coiled organ over here it's like a snail but when you uncoil the cochlea it looks like as if you're blowing through a party whistle this is a unfolded cochlea we'll see that the sound waves as it enters the external auditory canal hits the eardrum moves through the ossicles it will enter the oval window the force will displace fluids in the scala vestibuli. Some of the force will be transferred to the scala media where the basilar membrane is found. And the other uh, force will move fluid to the apex, then through the scala tympani, down to the round window. Now take note that the round window doesn't have any openings on it. It just has a membrane which stops fluid it just accommodates movement of fluid as fluid moves from above from the oval window so it doesn't pour out water it's just like a balloon you when you press a balloon it accommodates movement it will actually stretch on one end but when the force is removed it will go back to its normal configuration and we have the organ of corti here at the scala media. And the vibrations will go into the acoustic nerve. To discuss the cochlea uh, in simpler terms, we will have to see it like this one. It is a test tube. And inside we have another test tube. And we have a wire inside the inner test tube. And the blue fluid is what we call the perilymph. And the inner fluid, the greenish one, is what we call the endolymph. Here we can see the different chambers of the cochlea. The first chamber is the scala vestibuli. It is continuous until the apex and it continues in the third chamber 
which is the scala tympani so vestibuli and tympani they are actually continuous to each other at the apex near the helicotrema and as such they contain the same fluid the perilymph peri meaning surrounding so the oval window is actually here and the round window is here so when you introduce sound here we have the oval window and the round window take note that these are stop uh, these are sealed with a sheath now when we introduce movement or force the fluid will actually move to the round window but it will not spill out because it is still covered with a sheath okay the middle chamber is what we call the scala media and it is green and here it is what we call the endolymph the endolymph is intimately connected to the hair cells which will give rise to the nerve and the nerve is represented by the wire over here so again scala vestibuli media tympani perilymph and endolymph the base is here and the apex is here the apex is near the helicotrema it is the part of the scala media at the apex here i will also emphasize that the vestibular membrane so here i will also emphasize that the vestibular membrane vestibular membrane or the reisner's membrane is very thin such as when force is applied through the oval window force will also propagate through the endolymph as well as the perilymph so let's go now to traveling wave theory so traveling wave theory is a fundamental cochlear response to acoustic stimuli consists of a displacement wave which propagates along the basilar membrane from base to apex so going back to the test tube earlier when the oval window receives force from a caustic stimuli it will actually dissipate the force and the force that will go into the scala media will will produce a wave in the basilar membrane from the base into the apex to further give you an idea how this traveling wave theory looks like here's a video You're looking at an uncoiled cochlea containing a basilar membrane floating in endolymph. The organ of corti, which contains the auditory receptors, sits upon the basilar membrane. Movement of the basilar membrane stimulates the auditory receptors. Notice two structural properties that determine the way the basilar membrane responds to sound. First, the basilar membrane is wider at the apex than at the base by a factor of about five. Second, the membrane stiffness decreases from base to apex, the base being about 100 times stiffer. When a sound wave pushes the footplate of the stapes at the oval window, endolymph is displaced within the scala media, the chamber containing the basilar membrane. Movement of the endolymph makes the basilar membrane bend near its base, starting a wave that propagates toward the apex. The distance the wave travels depends on its frequency. This high-frequency wave vibrates the stiff base of the membrane a good deal, but most of the energy is dissipated before the wave propagates very far. Now notice the difference in the traveling wave generated by a low-frequency sound. This generates a wave that travels all the way up to the floppy apex of the membrane before the energy is dissipated. These vibrations in the different parts of the basilar membrane establish a place code for sound frequency. This is because different locations on the membrane are maximally deformed at different frequencies. This mechanism is responsible for neural encoding of pitch. So as we can see in the video, the waves travel from the base to the apex and the base in the apex has different frequency sensitive areas. Take note that the base is very sensitive to high frequencies and the apex is sensitive to lower frequencies so 3000 here and base is uh, lower 50 again base higher frequencies apex lower frequencies 
This is what we call the place principle. The frequencies has a different place in specific parts of the cochlea. Just like this one, at the base, near the entrance in the oval window, higher frequencies are usually stimulated here or received here and the lower frequencies are in the apex. We can simplify this when we take a look at the pianist when we are in front of him. His left hand is striking the lower pitches or the lower frequencies and his right hand will hit the higher pitches or the high frequency. Here we will discuss more of the perilymph and the endolymph. Perilymph is found in the scala vestibuli and tympani. And the endolymph is in the scala media. The endolymph is positive, possessing around 80 millivolts compared to the perilymph. And this positivity is provided by the influx of potassium positive ions from the stria vascularis. So the stria vascularis provides the positive potassium ions in order for the endolymph to stay positive. This potassium is recycled after the endocochlear depolarization. So there is an active recycling of the positive potassium ion. This is the basis for the endocochlear potential, the 80 and the 0. The hair cells has a negative 70 millivolts to it. So there is a difference here and there's a difference here. Take a look at the composition of ear fluids in the endolymph and the perilymph. The endolymph here has a higher potassium than the perilymph. But the perilymph has a higher sodium compared to the endolymph. My mnemonics for this is peri high nako. Okay, peri high Na. Cool. Let's talk about the organ of Corti. So the organ of Corti is the complex we find inside the scala media. So the organ of Corti has a tectorial membrane. Take note that this is the Reisner's membrane and this is a tectorial membrane. They are different. So this is the Reisner membrane and this is the tectorial membrane. So the Reisner's membrane separates the scala vestibuli from the scala media and the tectorial membrane is the one that is in contact with the hair cells. Organ of Corti is the organ that generates nerve impulses in response to vibration. The actual receptors are the inner cells which is in contact with the auditory nerve and the outer hair cells which are there to tune the ear sensitivity. These also are the ones responsible for the autoacoustic emissions which we use in newborn hearing screening. The movement of the basilar membrane, this is the basilar membrane, so this is the basilar membrane, again Reisner membrane, tectorial membrane, basilar membrane. Basilar means base, so the movement of basilar membrane during the propagation of wave will move the basilar membrane medially and superiorly. So it moves superiorly and medially. This will make the hair cells in contact with the tectorial membrane and thus there will be excitation of the neurons. So here is a video uh, to So here's a video to further explain the organ of corti and its function and it's a really good video the organ of corti extends from the anterior part of the vestibule and coils for about two and a half turns around a bony pillar called the modialis in cross section the uppermost chamber is called the scala vestibuli the oval window is situated at the base of this chamber. The lowermost chamber is called the scala tympani. At the base of this chamber is where the round window is located. Both the scala vestibuli and scala tympani contain perilymph. Between the scala vestibuli and scala tympani is the scala media. This houses the organ of corti, which is referred to as the receptor organ of hearing. 
The scala media is filled with endolymph. The scala media includes structures from the tectorial membrane, basilar membrane, and hair cells, which sense the mechanical forces. The hair cells are located between the tectorial and basilar membranes. Approximately 16,000 hair cells are within the cochlea. There are two kinds of hair cells, inner and outer hair cells. 95% of the afferent fibers are from the inner hair cells, the sensory receptors that communicate with neurons from cranial nerve 8. Outer hair cells receive mostly efferent input from the superior olivary complex. The filamentous structures that connect the tips of adjacent stereocilia are known as tip links. These are thought to amplify the forces in the area of the molecular sensors. How does sound enter the cochlea? Compression hits the tympanic membrane, causing the stapes to transfer force to the oval window. The sound travels down the scala vestibuli, around the helicotrema, to the scala tympani, allowing its fluid perilymph to mix. From there, sound moves to the round window. High frequencies are encoded at the base, and low frequencies at the apex. It is this property that leads to the tonotopic map along the basal membrane. The manner in which the basilar membrane vibrates in response to sound is the key to understanding cochlear function. The hair cells are located between the tectorial and basilar membranes and are stimulated by the shearing force between the two caused by the pivot point of the two membranes. The pivot point of the basilar membrane becomes displaced the tectorial membrane moves across the tops of the hair cells, causing the stereocilia to bend. The ionic environment of the compartment plays a critical role in signal transduction. The apical portion of the hair cell is bathed in high potassium solution, and the base of the hair cell is bathed in potassium poor solution. This causes the opening of mechanosensitive channels, allowing potassium to flow into the cell, leading to depolarization. This, in turn, opens calcium channels at the basal end of the cell, leading to vesicular transmitter release to stimulate the nerve. Because the relative voltage and potassium levels are low at the base of the hair cell, potassium flows out of the cell. This establishes that potassium flow through the cell is used for both depolarization, potassium in at the apex, and repolarization, potassium out at the base of the hair cell. Once the signals reach the cochlear nerve, it will go to the brain via the auditory nervous pathway. So this is the pathway I was referring to. So once the signal from many, many organ of corti centers, it will merge into the vestibulocochlear nerve and it will start transmitting to the brainstem until it reaches the primary auditory cortex in the brain. The pathway has an acronym, we call it the ecolima. So the eighth nerve will synapse into the cochlear nucleus 
and the cochlear nucleus will communicate to the superior olivary nucleus. Another stop will be the lateral lemniscus, inferior colliculus, medial geniculate nucleus, and lastly the auditory cortex. Take note that there are many crossovers in the pathway, which means that a signal from the one side of the ear will cross to the other side. Some signals will just stay on the epilateral side. So hearing loss cannot be caused by a brain lesion on one side because there are many crossovers. There are also collaterals to the RAS and the cerebellum and it is exemplified when we hear a startling sound, we wake up or we, we begin to startle. The auditory nervous pathway by its many nucleus sharpen the sound signals delivered to the brain. So imagine we have so many sounds that we hear. As it goes up, the sound signals are being processed so that the brain can only hear what it needs to hear. For example, if you are in a concert, you just want to hear the singer is singing, your brain will actually process it so that you won't hear the other concert goers or the other unwanted sounds that you hear. In an example wherein you see your, your crush or your loved one, every other sound just disappears and you just hear her or his voice. That's how our auditory nervous pathway sharpen the sound signals. The arrows show where the crossovers happen. Lateralization. So lateralization is the ability of our brain to know where the sound is coming from, where, whether it's coming from the left, right, back, or up. Without lateralization, we won't be able to distinguish where the sound is coming from. For example, if we are hearing an ambulance, we do not know where the sound is coming from. Is it in the left, in the right, etc. So lateralization involves concepts such as interoral time difference and interoral level difference. Take this image as, as an example. So if we have a sound source coming from the right, so the time that it reaches our right ear is shorter than when sound is going to the left ear so there is a different in time that it arrives and you can see that this, the wave started a little bit late on the left than the right so the brain sees this difference and will tell its, itself that the sound should be coming from the right ear because there is a time difference. The nuclei that processes this is the medial superior olivary nuclei. Another is the amplitude difference or the level difference. In the lateral superior olivary nuclei, it can detect the intensity difference of the sound, also known as the interaural level difference. So going back to the image, we can see that Whenever there's a sound source on the right, the intensity that reaches the right ear is higher, meaning more volume is heard by the right ear compared to the left ear because the head actually shields the level. It deflects the volume away from the left ear. So the brain sees this the right has a higher amplitude than the left, which is shielded by the head, also known as the head shadow effect. And therefore, the volume heard by the left is lower than the right. So the brain sees this difference and lets the brain know that the source is, should be coming from the right. So testing the auditory nervous pathway, we test the pathway through a test called auditory brainstem reflex. This is a test wherein we measure a vocal potential generated by a brief click or tone transmitted by an acoustic transducer, usually an insert earphone or headphone, just like this one. We put transducer into the ear and we also put some surface electrodes wherein the waveforms are being analyzed. So we have different, so we have different electrodes 
So when a click or a tone is being introduced into the ear, the waveform is being measured by the surface electrodes. And this is the wave that is usually generated after measuring it from the surface electrodes. We have the wave 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So this is what we call the auditory brainstem reflex or ABR. This will identify auditory pathway problems and is used to confirm hearing loss. So usually, so the ultimate test to confirm that no sound is going to the brain and the brain cannot hear sound is the ABR. Because once there is no sound wave generated in the pathway, meaning the sound just stops short at the cochlea and never transfers up. So this is the way to confirm hearing loss. Let's talk about the auditory cortex. So sound will eventually end up in the temporal lobe in the superior temporal gyrus. This area of the brain will give meaning to sound and patterns of sounds heard. And this is particularly present in the Wernicke's area. The auditory cortex also has a primary and an association areas. Sounds that are received in the primary auditory complex are also being processed alongside with the association auditory cortex. This give further meaning to the sound heard as in the case of fear when we hear uh, a ghost sounds or screaming sounds, anger when we when we hear shouting or slurs or pleasure. So the raw sounds that we receive in the primary auditory complex is further being processed by giving it meaning by the by the association auditory cortex. So we'll go now to correlates. Hearing loss. So these are the causes of hearing loss. It can be conductive or sensory neural. Conductive can involve the external ear and middle ear. It is related to how sound waves are being conducted until it reaches the inner ear. And sensory neural, which comprise of the inner ear being problematic or there is a problem in the central pathways. Examples of conductive hearing loss are impacted cerumen, otitis externa, foreign body, and in the middle ear includes acute otitis media, otitis media with effusion, tympanic membrane perforation, autosclerosis. So let's discuss the pathophysiology of the different kinds of conductive hearing loss. Impacted cerumen. If you see in this image, sound waves cannot enter and reach the eardrum because of a impacted cerumen or a solidified earwax, just like this one. Otitis externa, when the ear canal skin is so swollen because of infection, like this one, it's so swollen, the propagation of sound waves cannot reach the eardrum effectively. Foreign body, just like a bead or a toy, of course, it will block sound waves from entering. Otitis media, or what we call middle ear infection, media, middle, otitis, inflammation of the ear. Fluid is usually present, and the middle ear is infected and inflamed. Such as this one, infected. We are looking at it through the otoscope. In this case, the presence of infected fluid will hamper the efficient movements of the ossicles and thus hearing is dampened. Symptoms of otitis media includes earache, fever, and ear discharge. Most of the cases of otitis media resolves on its own because usually the causative organism is viral. Antibiotics are given if it won't resolve in two or three days, which suggests that it is already bacterial in nature. Otitis media with diffusion. This is sometimes called the glue ear or serous otitis media. In this case, the middle ear has a fluid but it is not infected. Just like this one, we have bubbles. Like in this case, we can see bubbles, meaning that there is fluid but the fluid is not yellowish or purulent. Otitis media with diffusion typically precedes and follows an ear infection. In this case, water is retained in the middle ear cavity even after an otitis media. 
Symptoms usually only includes hearing loss but can also include such as hearing of water bubbles and dampening or muffling of sounds. Antibiotics won't help because this is just accumulation of water after a previous infection and what we do is we just have to wait for the fluid to settle down around two weeks. Conductive hearing loss tympanic membrane perforation. So there are many causes of tympanic membrane perforation. So if we perforate the eardrum, sound will not be able to move the eardrum very well because sound waves will pass through the perforation. So it won't move the drum. Just imagine like a, just imagine a drum with a hole in it. When you strike the drum, sound is never the same compared with an intact drum. Perforation could be very small or medium, just like in this case, or a total perforation. In which case, the bigger the perforation, the bigger the hearing loss is. So the causes include trauma, like barotrauma, fractures in the ear, infections, just like acute otitis media, wherein fluids will tend to burst the eardrums in order to relieve the pressure, chronic otitis media, tuberculosis, or sometimes it is iatrogenic, wherein we introduce uh, ventilation tubes to relieve pressure. Autosclerosis is a phenomenon in the stapes, wherein there is overgrowth of bone in the stapes, and thus rendering the stapes immobile. So autosclerosis is a labyrinthine endochondral sclerosis upon the stapedio-vestibular joint invasion that results into loss of motion of the stapes. Sensory neural hearing loss. It can be congenital, a non-syndromic, or acquired, like presbycusis, noise-induced, and acoustic neuroma. Sensory hearing loss with a CX26 mutation. So this is a hearing loss secondary to a mutation on the connexin 26 protein on the GJB2 gene. This is the most common non-syndromic recessive genetic hearing loss and this accounts for 50% of recessive hearing loss in children. The CX26 protein is essential to maintain the high potassium concentration in the endolymph for excitation. So remember the stria vascularis earlier that pumps out potassium in order for the endolymph to remain positive? If you don't have the CX26 protein, the stria vascularis cannot maintain that high potassium concentration and thus there will be problems in the endocochlear potential. So next is the presbycusis. So presbycusis is a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss in old age. Higher frequencies are first to be affected. If you can remember, higher frequencies are found on the base of the cochlea and the region of the base is the most overused region. Take a look at this one. This is still the cochlea and the basilar membrane. So sound enters through the base before going to the apex, right? Now, if you have 80 years or 70 years of hearing these sounds and you know, uh, receiving all this acoustic stimuli, then waves will propagate here until the apex, base and apex, base and apex. So it is not surprising that the base is always being used. It's always the most overused. As such, as such, the base will be more affected when we have old age. This is followed later by the middle and lower frequencies. So in the typical audiogram in presbycosis, the usual is a loss first in the higher frequencies followed by the middle and the lower frequencies. So this is what we call the audiogram which dips into the higher frequencies. Patients will have difficulty in hearing high frequency sounds and high frequency letters such as F, S, and TH. Now we go to noise induced hearing loss. One in four of U.S. adults will have hearing loss due to exposure to much noise. Noise-induced hearing loss, or NIHL, is a hearing loss caused by prolonged exposure to noise. This is usually bilateral, irreversible, and progressive. 
it means that once your ear is exposed to loud sounds early in your life, you'll still carry the risk cumulatively as you grow old. Remember that the ear canal transmits effectively the frequencies of 3000 to 4000 Hz. Therefore, when we are exposed to noise in our lives, the one that is most affected frequency in the basal membrane is the 4000 Hz. So usually we will have a deeping at the 4000 Hz here, deeping, bilateral. And this is very typical of a noise-induced hearing loss. So take note that all of it are normal except for the 4000 Hz because the ear canal transmits 4000 Hz effectively. So in this picture, we will see the common sounds we hear and their intensities in decibels. So again, the whisper or normal voice is around 30 to 80. Traffic is around 50 to 90. And concerts, discos, and alarms is around 90 and above. From 120 and above, it only takes seconds of exposure to irreversibly damage the cochlea. The rest, it will take some time. And take note that this is cumulative, meaning if you have been exposed to a lot of noise in your lifetime, it will accumulate. That's why in other countries, they have a policy on maximum daily exposure to their workers, especially those in high-risk industries like airports, gun range, or discos. So if you have an exposure at your workplace with around 90 decibels, your exposure limit should be 8 hours. But if you go up, like if you're a DJ, let's say, DJ, you can only be in your workplace for an hour. More than that, you will have risk of noise in this hearing loss. So as you go up the noise level, you cut your exposure limit to a number of hours. Better yet, you put some earmuffs to protect your ears. Acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma is a tumor which evolved from swan cell sheets and usually occur adjacent to the cochlear or vestibular nerve. If this is our cochlea and this is our vestibular nerve and our auditory nerve, there is a tumor which sometimes impinges on the nerve and thus you will have a sensory neural hearing loss. They tend to occupy the cerebellopontine angle or the CPA as seen here. Symptoms of which are hearing loss, tinnitus, dizziness, and compression symptoms of cranial nerve 7 and cranial nerve 5. Acoustic neuroma can be bilateral, especially in patients with type 2 neurofibromatosis. Now, let's talk about the vestibular system. So this is the labyrinth. Labyrinth is composed of the cochlea and also the vestibular system. We have already talked about the cochlea. Now let's discuss the vestibular system. So the vestibular system are the sensory organs responsible for spatial orientation, visual image stabilization, and balance control. It is mainly found in the membranous labyrinth. So all of these are membranous labyrinth. This is in case in a bony labyrinth. The inner ear is sometimes called the labyrinth, I think uh, that's an appropriate name for it. And uh, let's just remove it. It sits in a bony cavity. So the, there are two parts to this labyrinth, an outer bony labyrinth, and then inside it, a membranous labyrinth suspended with fluid outside and fluid inside. And the vestibular system has three semicircular canals, one, two, and three, and two large chambers, which we call the utricle and the saccule. The vestibular system has a connection to the cochlea because this is part of the labyrinth, and the connection is via the cochlear duct over here. So the fluids, essentially the endolymph, is connected to the endolymph of the vestibular system. So if you have problems in the endolymph, in the vestibular system, you will have ultimately a problem in the cochlea endolymph system. Let's talk about utricle and saccule. Utricle and saccule detect gravity, linear acceleration, and tilt. So the utricle here, which is on the horizontal plane, detects horizontal acceleration. 
Succule, on the other hand, which is on the vertical plane, detects movement or motion in the vertical plane. The utricle and succule are oriented 90 degrees to each other in an L fashion, L, L, utricle and the succule, and the L, and both of them uses the macula system, which has autolites on it. So let's discuss about the macula system. So the macula system has hair cells and also has a gel-like membrane and above the membrane has the autolites or the autoconia or the stones. When the autoconia moves and the gel moves, it will displace and make movements in the hair cells and thus it will provide signals to the brain that the head is moving. So the autolites, also called as statoconia or autoconia, the weight of it bends the gel with the kinocilia. So the kinocilia are projections of the hair cells and it is connected to the shorter stereocilia and movement of the stereocilia towards the kinocilium, there will be depolarization or stimulation and the movement away from the kinocilium, there will be hyperpolarization or inhibition. So the movement towards or away will be detected by the hair cells and the hair cells will transmit these signals to the vestibular nerve. In this image, we will see that this is the utricle. When we bend our heads sideways, there will be a excitation. And if we bend it on the other side, there will be hyperpolarization. Let's go now to the semicircular canals. So this is the utricle, this is the succule, these are the semicircular canals. We have three. We have the horizontal semicircular canal or what we call the lateral semicircular canal. We have the anterior or superior semicircular canal and we have the posterior semicircular canal. The semicircular canals detects changes in head rotation or what we call an angular acceleration and it also detects the rate of change in three planes of space. The semicircular canals also has a predictive function for balance. For example, if you are running then suddenly turns it is the semicircular canals that give off the signals to the brain and also to the muscles in order to maintain balance so that we won't fall off. The semicircular canals uses the crista system. This is the crista system. In contrast to the utricle and succule which uses the macula system. This is the crista system. The crista is this one. It, it has a cupula and it is encased in the ampulla. Again, the semicircular canals functions in detecting rotations of the head. Different kinds of semicircular canals are assigned to different movements of the head and it will also produce the reactive postural response and anticipatory postural adjustments needed to maintain our balance. The semicircular canals uses the crista system. The ampulla or the enlargement at the ends of the semicircular canals is functioning as a housing. The cupula is a gelatinous mass which projects from the crista and functions like a turbine bucket or cup as in the water turbine and detects movement of endolymph moving towards it. Bending the cupula in one side will produce depolarization and excitation and moving the cupula oppositely will produce hyperpolarization or inhibition. The crista ampullaris, this one, has hair cells with cilia on it and movements of the cupula that will be transmitted to the hair cells and the hair cells will give the signals to the vestibular nerve. Take note that the semicircular canals doesn't have any otolites. There's no stones unlike the macula system. So the crista system works like this one. So we have the cupula, the crista, the hair cells. So movement of fluid on one side will produce excitation and movement of the cupula on the opposite side will produce inhibition. But take note that the semicircular canals has counterparts on the other side. It means that when one semicircular canal, let's say the horizontal or the lateral will move in this way, this will excite, but the other semicircular canal on the other side will move the other direction, meaning it will inhibit. So it will tell the brain that 
we are turning to the right because this one will inhibit this one will excite it also goes to the this one it has a counterpart on the posterior semicircular canal on the other side and it will tell the brain that we are moving up side or bend our heads sideways so again excitation in one inhibition in other so horizontal will have uh, inhibition in the other horizontal canal the anterior semicircular canal will have inhibition in the posterior semicircular canal the posterior semicircular canal will have an inhibition in the anterior semicircular canal on the other side vestibular system connections the vestibular nerve will receive all the signals from the semicircular canals and the utricle and the saccule via the vestibular ganglion. We have the superior part and the inferior part. We call this the vestibular ganglion. The vestibular ganglion will give rise to the vestibular nerve and it will join with the cochlear nerve to form the vestibulocochlear nerve. However, the connections in the vestibular nerve will end up in the vestibular nuclei different from the cochlear nuclei. Okay, we have the vestibular nuclei and it is found in the rostral medulla. So the vestibular nuclei will receive input from the spinal cord from the lateral vestibulo spinal tract which will receive input from the extensor muscles the anterior vestibulo spinal tract which will receive input from the neck muscles it will also receive input from the cerebellum the extra ocular muscles via the medial longitudinal fasciculus this one and this will facilitate the vestibulo ocular reflex or the dull eye reflex it will also receive input from the reticular formation for vomiting, especially those with dizziness, and thalamus for the conscious perception of movement. So in summary, the vestibular system works hand-in-hand -hand with the visual proprioceptive systems, and they will be coordinated in the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex, and also the brainstem, so that this all will gives us a sense of balance through the motor inputs as the vestibular ocular reflex, motor impulses to control the eye, and motor impulses to make postural adjustments. Thus, we will have balance. So let's go now to clinical correlates. So dizziness and vertigo. So dizziness is a sensation of disturbed or impaired spatial orientation without false or distorted sense of motion so dizziness is actually an impaired spatial orientation but there's no sense of motion if you have a sense of motion but there is no actual motion it is what we call a vertigo it is it is described by patients as spinning sensations and vertigo may result from diseases of the ear disturbances of the vestibular centers or diseases in the pathway of central nervous systems the causes of dizziness and vertigo can be peripheral such as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV, Meniere's disease, labyrinthitis, and vestibular neuritis. It can also be central such as in cerebrovascular disorders, specifically vertebrovascular insufficiency. It can also be caused by a migrainous vertigo. So let's discuss first BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So this is the most common cause of vertigo in clinical practice. And this is caused by the accumulation of otolites in the semicircular canals. Remember that the otolites are part of the macula system and it is found only in the succule and the utricle. Whenever otolites gets dislodged into the semicircular canals which doesn't have outlets it will stimulate the cupula system and thus thus you will have sense of motion when there is no actual motion the most common bppv is found in the posterior semicircular canal bppv is triggered usually by rapid changes in the position of the head and most around 80 percent will recover spontaneously BPPV is dizziness, which is stimulation of semicircular canals by the otolites. Duration of it is seconds, and there is no associated hearing loss, tinnitus, oral fullness, and other features. Let's go now to Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease is an episodic attack of tinnitus, hearing loss, oral fullness, and vertigo lasting minutes to hours. 
So you will suspect Meniere's disease to any dizziness with hearing loss. So take note that the labyrinth, there is connection of the vestibular system and the cochlea via the cochlear duct. Meniere's disease happen because there is inadequate absorption of endolymph that leads to endolymphatic high drops. Simply said, the endolymph in the vestibular system accumulates and this accumulation will have changes in the vestibular system, particularly in the semicircular canals and you will trigger sense of motion. Take note that since there is accumulation of endolymph in the vestibular system, there will be also accumulation in the cochlear duct, such as you will also have hearing loss. The triggers of Meniere's disease are the following, high salt intake, caffeine, stress, nicotine, and alcohol. To further explain what Meniere's disease is, this is the endolymphatic system. It's, it is found both in the semicircular canals and the cochlea. Now, if you have accumulation, the endolymphatic system will swell. You see, there is a swelling. This swelling will stimulate the vestibular system as well as there will be hearing loss in the cochlea. Just like this one, imagine, and there's a swelling. So, Meniere's disease, its duration is minutes to hours and usually it has hearing loss. It also has tinnitus or ringing in the ears as well as a patient will have oral fullness or a sensation of pressure or warmth in the ear. Vestibular neuronitis. This is dizziness due to a benign self-limited inflammation of the vestibular nerve. This is the vestibular nerve. This is the cochlear nerve. If you have inflammation of the vestibular nerve, you will have dizziness. This is an acute onset of disabling vertigo often accompanied by nausea, vomiting, and imbalance without hearing loss. Since the nerve affected is only the vestibular nerve, the vestibular system is only affected. The cochlear nerve is usually spared so that there is no hearing loss. So this is a dizziness without a hearing loss. It resolves over days and thought to be due to a viral infection such as measles, mumps, and herpes zoster. So vestibular neuronitis, it lasts hours to days, but doesn't have hearing loss, doesn't have tinnitus, doesn't have oral fullness. Labyrinthitis is an acute infection of the whole inner ear. Sometimes we call it the membranous labyrinthitis, resulting in inflammation of the labyrinth. So the labyrinth is composed of the vestibular system and the cochlear system. So there will be vertigo, there will be hearing loss. The cause of it, either a viral or bacterial, and occurs usually as a complication of an acute and chronic otitis media or bacterial meningitis. Labyrinthitis, the duration is usually days. There will be hearing loss, there will be tinnitus, and there is a history of a recent acute otitis media. So to summarize the most common vertigo entities, you can put a table, one column is hearing loss, one column if the vertigo is episodic or persistent. In BPPV, it is episodic, only seconds to minutes, and it doesn't have hearing loss. But if it's persistent, hours to days, and doesn't have hearing loss, it is vestibular neuronitis. If you have hearing loss, on the other hand, and it is episodic, it is called Meniere's disease. And if you have a hearing loss, and a persistent vertigo, it is labyrinthitis, especially if you have a history of an acute ear infection. A central cause of vertigo is usually caused by a vertebrobasilar insufficiency or a stroke. Vertigo here is due to the insufficiency or strokes in the vertebrobasilar region. So this is the vertebral arteries and it will join into a basilar artery. This is what we call the posterior circulation. And the posterior circulation will affect the midbrain, pons, medulla, and also the ears. So if we could recall the brainstem earlier, this is supplied by the vertebrobasilar arteries and stroke or insufficiency will produce dizziness. Aside from vertigo, you will have symptoms such as diplopia because of its connection to the eyes, dysarthria, weakness, and clumsiness of the limbs because of the affectation of the brainstem. Vertigo is present in half of them and it's very important for us to rule out stroke whenever our patient will present as vertigo, especially those vertigo which is long lasting or, that, or is not episodic. So that concludes my lecture. So I hope you pick up something.
so if you have any questions so that concludes my lecture so if you have any questions you can contact me using these details you can email me if you have questions or text me or even visit my facebook page so i could discuss more of hearing and balance with you and thank you very much